Well, good day, and thank you for tuning in to our Calvary Chapel Louisville broadcast. I'm Pastor Rock. We'll be picking up today in Genesis chapter 36. And while you're opening in your Bibles, I'd like to remind you to drop by our website, calvarychapellouisville.com, for updates regarding the church and its various ministries. If you have a request, prayer request, or a comment, please leave them in the comments section below. And with that, let's get started with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. We ask your blessing upon this time, going through your word, and that you would anoint your word in our hearts and in our minds today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so going to Genesis chapter 36, we begin uh, with verse 1. Now this is a genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Now a little bit of background from the previous chapter, Jacob had... Uh, gone from Shechem down to Bethel and then from Bethel all the way down to Bethlehem and then subsequently uh, to Hebron and he had met Esau there and together they had buried uh, their their father Isaac so picking up from there we sort of get into the genealogy of, of Esau and the impact that he had upon his family and the people that he saw in addition to that we see that there's a characteristic that sort of follows here when Abraham had died, then uh, both uh, Ishmael and Isaac gathered together there at Hebron and buried Abraham. And we see basically the same thing happening now with Isaac, where Jacob and uh, Esau are burying uh, Isaac there at Hebron. So it starts here where this is a genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau, the name itself means hairy. The name Edom means red and that not only personified or described uh, Esau himself but it's also going to be what the land is that Esau would end up settling in that area would be called Edom later on it would also be regarded as Idumea which is where the dynasty of the Herods came through during Jesus's time so we're not going to go that uh, far into it but the main point is Esau is Edom so moving on it says in verse 2 Esau took wives from the daughters of Canaan Ada the daughter of Elan the Hittite Ahib um, Aholibama the daughter of Ana the daughter of Zibion the Hivite uh, and Basimath Ishmael's daughter sister of Nebajoth so here we see that the wives are ordered we'll end up seeing that the wives are ordered by the number of sons and grandsons that they have because uh, the first one here, Ada, specifically, we see uh, her being listed. She was the first wife, but then we have Aholibama, which was actually the the um, the third wife here. And then we come to uh, Basimath, as far as how the description is, how it becomes described. So Aholibama and Ada together were... Uh, we're in Canaan, but then later on when we see the description, we'll, we'll see a change a little bit. Anyway, I'll get to that here shortly. Something about uh, Canaan, that they were Canaanite wives, and later on, God would have Israel, and specifically under Joshua, later go in and utterly uh, destroy the inhabitants of Canaan because of their idolatry. This would include the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, of course the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and that's who uh, Ada and Aholibama uh, were were from. So, uh, moving on though, verse three tells us that Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, was the si sister of Nebajoth. That that basically means that they would have been first cousins because uh, Ishmael's daughter and Isaac's son ended up being married here. So, uh, moving on to verse four. Now Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basimath bore Reuel. So this is where we're seeing the we're seeing the jump here. The first wife has the one son Eliphaz, and then the third wife has the one son Reuel. And then verse five goes on and says, and Holibama bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. And these were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. So um, that. In verse 5, the second wife ends up bearing three sons to Esau. That becomes 
significant to some degree because what we'll end up seeing is their descendants or, or grandchildren are the ones uh, as far as how it's how it's ordered with regard to the the chiefs or the the ones who are overseeing the land so verse 6 then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his household his cattle and all his animals and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob so he was previously in Canaan and then he was now going to go away from the presence of Jacob because for a couple of reasons first of all they just had they were both so rich and they had so much livestock that the land couldn't sustain them which is what we see in verse 7 uh, but in addition to that there was still just a division that they were that needed to take place between them because of the situations before and I believe that uh, Esau wanted to make a name for himself which we'll see just by this chapter here he does make a name for himself he an entire country and a number of people that would be called by his name so in verse 7 it says for their possessions oh it says that they went to the we would end up finding that they end up going to the south so we'll, we'll come to this their possessions were too great for them to dwell together in the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock so Esau dwelt in Mount Seir in Edom so it's already being acknowledged that Mount Seir is Edom because he's going to go there and the people in the inhabitants of Mount Seir are going to be assimilated into the tribe of Edom so Mount Seir was actually named after the patriarch Seir and the town where they were at was uh, Hor, H-O-R. So uh, Seir was a Horite, it says, and they had a, there was actually a large mountain named after, after him, Mount Seir specifically. The actual location is from the bottom of the Dead Sea south to where the Gulf of Aqaba comes up. There's, it's about 110 miles distance there and right about halfway at a 50 to 60 mile mark between there to the this would be to the west I'm sorry to the east toward Jordan or into what we now know as Jordan that's where Mount Seir was so this is where uh, Esau ended up dwelling or settling settling down he left the land of Canaan went south 60 to 80 miles and dwelt at Mount Seir or in the area of Seir um, in addition to that well, well we'll just move on let's move on to verse 9 and this is a genealogy of Esau the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir and these were the names of Esau's sons Eliphaz the son of Ada the wife of Esau Reuel the son of Basimath the wife of, the wife of Ed, Esau verse 11 and the sons of Eliphaz were Taman Omar Zepho Gatam Kenaz. Now Zem Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. So here we see Eliphaz is the one son of the first wife of Esau. So the first son, he ends up having subsequently five sons who would be grandsons to Esau, plus one more who would be from a concubine named Timnah. And her son would be, it's significant, his name would be Amalek. So we have six sons specifically who were from, again, the sequence is from Esau to Eliphaz and then the six uh, grandsons there. So Amalek specifically, he's interesting because he ended up settling later in the desert of Negev which is just south of where Judah is. And he's going to continue, or his people are going to continue to be significant throughout the scripture because of an event that took place about 500 years later under Moses and Amalek actually attacking after the Exodus. And you'll remember specifically what had taken place. The children of Israel had come out of Egypt had crossed the Red Sea and then from there they were in the the land or this this desert area and Amalek opted to do a preemptive strike against them and this is where we read the story of 
Moses telling Joshua to go to battle against them and Aaron and her are supposed to hold up or basically what ended up happening is as long as the staff was lifted up Moses staff was lifted up Joshua would would prevail against the Amalekites but if Moses became tired then the staff would be lowered and then subsequently the, the Amalekites would prevail over Joshua so Aaron and her came alongside and held the staff up for Moses from the sides held his hands up so that they would continue to prevail and from there as a result of that preemptive strike that uh, the Amalekites made against Israel here we see that in Exodus chapter 17 the Lord said to Moses I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven now this hasn't officially taken place because we're still talking about Amalek today but the prophecy here is with regard to them and their wickedness in having this preemptive strike against you could argue their brother or their half-brother you know against uh, Israel and specifically it goes on the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation and this is definitely what we see throughout the scripture the Lord is continuing to have the Amalekites come up against Israel and the Lord goes after the Amalekites through the power through the power of the Lord Israel prevails and it's really a picture of in many ways the way that our adversary the devil works against people and has worked against Israel specifically that they're always there um, just creating problems so the Lord will um, be at war against them and will eventually utterly blot out the remembrance which if we think about that in terms of our adversary the devil that's great news even though we may struggle even though Israel throughout its history may be struggling one day the devil will be um, cast to into the uh, into the outer darkness and he'll be well no he'll be cast into the um, the lake of fire excuse me and then and then utterly cast out and he won't come to remembrance anymore there, there won't be the the concern for him anymore he'll he'll be done with so verse 13 goes on these were the sons of Reuel and re remember Reuel is uh, the the third well this is the this is from the line of the third wife who is the daughter of Ishmael so Reuel uh, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah, these are the sons of Basimath, uh, Esau's wife. So Reuel has uh, four grandsons, and this again is where we're seeing what the order is. We have Eliphaz with the, with the six grandsons, and then we have Reuel with the, with the four grandsons. And then these were the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, uh, the daughter of Anah, the uh, daughter of Zibion. She bore to Esau, Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. Now these are the sons, but no grandsons are mentioned. So again, if we were to look at this, we have uh, the, the, the one son and his six grandsons, the second son, um, or, well, the, the, the second in line ends up being the, the one son with the four grandsons and then the, uh, then the three sons afterwards. So moving on, from verse 14 let me just say the reason why I believe that this is significant is just the the Lord is placing them in these this order because the inheritance is is important and it's defining the inheritance through uh, through the sons specifically and and through the grandsons so and the blessings of multiple kids and and so on so uh, verse let's see verse 15 through 19 now I'm not gonna spend too much time reading this because there's a lot of names that I'm gonna end up botching and that we're gonna see this throughout a lot of the rest of this this chapter but there are some notes to make first of all in verse 15 through 19 the chiefs that are referenced here are our governors in fact the King James Version actually calls them dukes and it's the idea of, of people who have governorship over specific territories so 
as we read through this, we're going to see that there's 12 chiefs, specifically under Esau, which are inclusive of the five grandsons, plus the four grandsons, plus the three sons. So, um, anyway, moving on, it says, and these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. And we have Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, um, were chief uh, Taman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, uh, Korah, Gedim, and Amalek. And these are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom, and they were the sons of, of Ada. So here we see that even Amalek is regarded as one of the sons of Ada here. And then you have Reuel and his sons that are listed, and then um, under Basimath, and then you have the uh, verse 18 where Aholibama, her sons are listed. The others are grandsons, but here we have the three sons that are listed as chiefs. And verse 19, and these are the sons of Edom, who is Edom, excuse me, these are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these were their chiefs. Again, just the emphasis, again, Esau is Edom. And so he, as a person, is represented now as a nation, much like you could say that Jacob was represented as Israel. It's sort of um, defining it similarly. So moving on, though, we come to verses 20 through 25. And here what we're going to see are the descendants of Seir. Seir, the person, not uh, the land, uh, the, the patriarch who is the one that Mount Seir was named after and who was the Horite. And specifically, we would see that they're going to end up being absorbed into Edom. Now he's listed, but we're seeing who they are and that absorption. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite who inhabited the land, Lotan, uh, Shobal, Zibion, Ana, Dishan, Azer, Dishan, uh, Dishan. And these are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir, in the land of Edom. And then going on, it gives a breakdown from not just the sons, but then the, the sons of the sons and, the, and so on. So in the sons of Lotan, verse 22, were Horai and um, Herman, or Heman, uh, Lotan's sister was Timna. Now that's significant because Timna was the concubine. This would have been Amalek's mom. So under Eliphaz, the first son of Esau. So there's more to look at. I'm going to place some, some references in the comments section down below if you want to look at some more of the detail about this. But uh, Timna here is, is referenced and uh, showing that she's the, the concubine uh, here, at least in reference to verse 12. So verse 23 goes on, and these are the sons of Shobal, and then lists, the, lists their names. And then we come to verse 24. These are the sons of Zibion and lists their names, and specifically it says that uh, this was the Anna who found water, so um, found water in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of his father Zibion. These were the children of Anna, uh, Dishan and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna. So again, we're, we're seeing uh, the reference here to Aholibama, verse 25, Esau's second, second wife. So we're seeing this is all interconnected and and uh, just anyway, you're just seeing how, how things are tied together through not only the genealogy, but, but seeing how they're interweaving uh, back and forth and how because of their proximity, we just see things happening like Timna, for example, uh, her situation. So verse 26 through 28, we see the remaining sons and grandsons of Seir, the patriarch of, of the city of Hor and where Mount Seir was, was named. These are the sons of Dishan, Hemden, um, Eshban, Ithran, Sharon. I, I'm not going to read the rest of these because I'm not doing that well on the reading of them. But definitely go ahead and read through them and do your best to try to pronounce those. But verse 29 through 30 goes on and we see the leaders of the town of Hor. So this would be Seir's sons. And these were the chiefs of the Horites. And then it relists the same list that we sat that we saw in verse 20 so specifically these are the chiefs of Horite of the Horites and then Lotan, Shobal, uh, Zibion, Ana uh, and so on so moving on from there in verse 31 
we see uh, something that's paralleled in First Chronicles chapter 1. So moving all the way forward in the First Chronicles, after the kings are established in Israel, we come to this section, which is interesting because it says that these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. So basically, verses 31 through 40 are the kings of Edom, you could say after Israel's, Israel, after Esau's dynasty. So after his sons and grandsons and subsequent to them fell out of the position of leadership that they would have been, then now what we're seeing are the kings of Edom that would take their positions or that would be kings in that vicinity who weren't necessarily directly related to Esau. So reading through this, um, notice also it says, before any king reigned over the children of Israel. So this is already anticipating that Israel's going to have kings before they actually have kings. This is anticipating that this would take place. Again, assuming that this is written by, by Moses himself, this is long before any kings were uh, going to be established. You could argue, though, that there was a prophecy that there would be a king because it's in reference to Jesus being both the Savior and the king himself who would come and establish that role and position. So a Messiah and a king much like uh, Melchizedek was earlier in, in uh, Genesis. C certainly not a Messiah, but a priest and a king. And that Jesus would come in that same manner or in that, in that same order. So, looking forward from here, we see, let's see, verse 32. So, Bela, the son of Baor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinabah. And then when Bela died, Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his place. And when Jobab died, Husham, and then it goes on listing a number of names, really, all the way through verse 39. Now, there is some significance here with verse 32, because it says, Bela, the son of Baor, reigned in Edom. So, Edom, of course, was in that area. That's where Esau's at. If you were to go north, you come to the territory of Moab, which is just on the other side of the Dead Sea. Uh, Moab and Ammon are the two sons of, of, um, of Lot. And so they were dwelling on the other side, of course, so basically to give a proximity of where things are at, you've got Edom and then to the north you would have Moab, subsequent to that you would have Ammon. Why is this important? Because after the exodus, the, uh, the Israelites had come through and they were, they were um, conquering into the promised land. And they had actually defeated the Amorites, the brother of the Moabites. So Ammon and Moab. So the king of Moab was concerned. So he conscripted a prophet to do some work to try to get a curse upon the Israelites. And that prophet, specifically, he was um, Balaam, the son of Beor, which is where we come to. So Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and it's believed, some people believe that Bela and Balaam were the same person. I don't believe necessarily come to that conclusion, but I do believe that they were brothers. And that specifically, if we were to read forward here, we, we find that Balaam the prophet was actually, um, who's referenced in Numbers chapter 22, that it tells us that he was actually further, he was over by the river Euphrates doing prophet things there for prophet, and then they ended up calling him back to the area to have a curse upon the children of Israel. So. Again, verse 32, Bela, the son of Baor, reigned in Edom, and it's believed that uh, he may be the brother of Balaam the prophet. That'll be in our, the notes down below as well. It's very fascinating to read into. So, looking at verse 32, and when Bela died, Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his place. Now, Jobab, there's another Jobab that was referenced in Genesis chapter 10, 
And that Jobab we believe to be Job, who actually was, you know, had, wrote the book Job. And some people have said, well, are they the same one? But if you look at the genealogies and the dates, it appears that it wouldn't be the same one. It was another person named Jobab, not the same one as Genesis chapter 10. But it's fascinating nonetheless and, and an interesting study to pursue. So, um, when Jobab died, who was the, the king over, over uh, Edom at this point, then Husham of the land of the Tamanites reigned in his place, and Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bidad, uh, attacked Midian in the field of Moab and it just goes into a lot of the history and some things that are taking place um, and then it talks about a fellow by the name of Saul of Rehoboth by the river how he reigned in his place Rehoboth by the river means street by the river and we don't really know where that is it's believed that that may mean that he has some sort of connection back to the river Euphrates or it could be the Nile but nevertheless he comes into this place of uh, authority and uh, kingship. So when he died, died uh, Baal Hanan, the son of Achor, reigned in his place. And then it goes on uh, talking about just some of the other people that had reigned. Now, in verse 40 through 43, we see the chiefs here, and they're likely representing the uh, territories of Edom. So the actual territories that are there at the time. Um, after the time of the kings or that may have been designated to them, but you had the kings reigning. So these are the names of the chiefs of Esau according to their families, verse 40, and by their names. And it lists uh, Timna, uh, Alva, uh, Jathith, and Aholibama. Not the same Aholibama, not the woman who uh, was married or, you know, married in the mother of Esau's son, but, or sons, but a, a different one and going on it lists a number of names till we get to verse 43 our last verse where it says Esau was the father of the Edomites and again Esau is Edom emphasizing this point that there's this connection Esau the person Edom the land the uh, territory the structure the government all of that um, so when you go through a genealogy like this, there's always little tidbits that you can pull out, and I hope that I pulled out some of those that are worth examining and, and further study. Sometimes we can just look at Esau, and you know we think about what we see in Romans, uh, Jacob I've, lo I've loved, Esau I've hated, because he gave up his birthright, he sold his birthright, and he, um, he allowed himself to be you know, swindled out of his, uh, his blessing and so it'd be easy to just disregard Esau but the thing that's interesting to me is that when I look at this particular chapter and genealogies in general other than the details I see how especially how Esau is Edom I see how Esau impacted a lot of lives and he impacted and influenced a lot of people and that leads me to consider, from a devotional standpoint, we look at Esau's life and all the people that he touched for better or for worse, and how it related to the future, relating to Amalek and, and Seir and all of and Ammon and, and um, the, the Moabites, and even down in Midian which is in Saudi Arabia. All of these people who are influenced directly by Esau. What's my point? For us to consider all the people that we've influenced. You know, whose lives have we impacted? And have we impacted them for the better or for the worse? And what's the future of that impact? And just to consider, you know, if we've impacted them for the better, then, then give thanks. Are there people that maybe our children, grandchildren, people that we've known over the years that we can give thanks for their lives if it's been a positive impact and we've been a blessing to them but if we've impacted them for the worst then it's worth taking the time to consider being reconciled with them either directly or if they're not available to be reconciled with then 
to still be able to take that before the Lord and to be reconciled with them before the Lord. And that could be parents, that could be um, grade school conflicts, whatever those situations are, to look for that opportunity for reconciliation. And then lastly, how that relates to the future. So what's been the impact of our lives for people in the future? So most cases we don't really know what that is, but we can impact them now simply by looking at in terms of eternity. And I don't know that Esau was thinking along that line. In fact, we could argue that Esau was very oriented and short-sighted to not look at things that may see the impact down the road. We see that certainly personally in his life. But we don't have to have that perspective. We can adopt a mindset that considers that every person that we've come in contact with to, to think about what our impact is upon them for future events. And what that really comes down to is where are they at with the Lord? The people that we know and have touched and influenced or not touched and not influenced and not been a part of their lives when we could have been, this is our opportunity to circle back around and see if we can impact their lives or influence their life, touch their life from an eternal standpoint. So, are we willing to pray and become engaged or do we just say, well, that's just a lost opportunity? But to go through that sort of inventory with the Lord, to think, who have I impacted for the better? Lord, I thank you for that. Who have I impacted for the worst? Lord, how can I make rest, reconciliation for that matter? And in both of those cases, Lord, who and how can I influence them or impact them for eternity? And if they don't know Jesus, then how can I pray for them and maybe become engaged in serving them or ministering to them in some manner? So, let's close in prayer. That's just something for us to go with in the Lord and we can hopefully lift that up in prayer and, and go forward in action afterward. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. We do pray that as we look at Esau's life and the impact of his life upon so many people, that likewise we can see that you've used us in similar ways. And I pray, God, that we would become engaged in the things that you want us to do, to give thanks, to reconcile, to pray, and to serve and to introduce people to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray now. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, and thank you for watching the Calvary Chapel Louisville broadcast. Until next time, God bless you, and don't forget to rejoice in the Lord always. Amen.